You are now listening to The Big Trade with Peter Pham, enlightening conversations for maximum market returns. It's um, an honor to have everyone here today. It's, I know we've co- spent a lot of time coordinating. I have uh, Mark and Becky here to discuss about the uh, art of war. Perhaps you guys could introduce yourself to the audience. Well, sure. Uh, I'm Becky Sheets Runkel. I am. I've written a couple of books on the art of war. I think we'll probably talk in a little bit more detail about those. And really, my focus has been on small business strategy and strategy for women in business, and that's based on using the art of war as the strategic roadmap there. Uh, My day job, in addition to speaking about and writing about the art of war, I am a marketing consultant, a communications professional, and an avid martial artist. Wow. I've done um, jiu-jitsu most of, well, all of my adult life and then some. So a lot of my perspective on Sun Tzu's Art of War is colored by my experiences um, in jiu-jitsu and, and other martial arts. Fascinating. And Mark? Yeah, uh, Mark McNeely. Uh, I've written a couple books on Sun Tzu's Art of War, uh, Sun Tzu and the Art of Business, which is more directed towards, of course, the business professional and the manager, and then Sun Tzu and the Art of Modern Warfare, which is really deals with warfare throughout time and applies Sun Tzu's principles to that. I currently teach as a uh, professor in marketing and organizational behavior at University of North Carolina at Keenan Fleckler Business School. Uh, Prior to that, I was an executive with Lenovo and then before that IBM. I've done some blogging for Fast Company and related to Sun Tzu, was able to be a guest speaker on the History Channel's Art of War special um, that they uh, show occasionally, uh, even today. So um, that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you, guys. Um, I think I want to start off with a very unique question, it, and that probably pertains to Sun Tzu himself. There's, I think, there's different interpretation to if he was an actual person or a fictional character. I don't know if um, maybe Becky or Mark, if you guys have any interpretation of that. I, I don't know what the actual context is and what factual evidence we have of the existence of Sun Tzu. Yeah, I think there's been a debate about that over time. Um, I, I think to me the most important thing is if I look at the document, whether the, the actual person Sun Tzu existed or if it was a you know, number of different uh, People, but the, the key thing to me is the document itself, the, the book, The Art of War, and then the, the accompanied writings that go with it, um, encapsulating the wisdom of, of, the, of what these people have learned or what Sun Tzu learned, and really giving us a different way to think about strategy, of course, in the military realm, but it's something that, you know, the reason I think we're talking today is because it applies in so many competitive situations. Becky, you want to add anything? I think that it's very fitting that, you know, Peter, that mysterious element that surrounds the person of Sun Tzu, did he exist, was was it an amalgamation of multiple military strategists who put this text together? I think it's very fitting that there is this, this mystique around the actual historical Sun Tzu, mm-hmm. and it's really consistent with his writings about being deceptive and to not make your, your, your true self known. Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I leave it to the reader. To, I, I agree with Mar- what Mark has said. I leave it to the reader to entertain the idea of the historical Sun Tzu, the warrior general, the philosopher sage. That's a really compelling concept, and it's one that I that I that I follow. It's one that I identify with. So the historical, like Mark said, the historical person of Sun Tzu is a little less relevant to me than the actual output and the strategy as it's played out and how we've seen it be successful on battlefields and in boardrooms throughout the world. So I leave it to the reader to believe what he or she wants, and, and I think that adds to the fun and, and to the mystery. Well, that's yeah, that's a very excellent um, way to, to think about it. I've, I've had actually many conversations with some individuals in, in finance, and, and when, I, when I hear your interpretation, both uh, Becky and Mark, it, it sounds as if this, this person has almost um, transcended beyond just being basically a normal person. And it, it seems as if now this, this strategies, these strategies have lasted thousands and thousands of years and probably will continue to do so. So, so that's just my thoughts on that. In, in regards to this book, The Art of War, uh, we'll talk about your books right after, but in regards to The Art of War, Becky, do you think that 
there it's it's very open ended like there's it's when you, when you look at science for example there's either a correct answer or a incorrect answer mm-hmm. do you find that there can be these these statements can be so open ended that it's almost up to interpretation on how something can be either explained like i don't think that you could use deductive reasoning and apply that to the principles of the art of war because you could always use other texts within the art of war to refute um something else that's being implemented do you guys ever find yourself with that that conundrum to some extent maybe we can hear from you first becky well sure and i i think that the application is really where where the fun is and that's why you'll find so many books and so many interpretations on the art of war because as you said it's not um do this and you'll get this result you know it's not it's not so black and white and so clear cut i mean we're applying this to boardrooms we're applying this to businesses and obviously that was not sun tzu's intent his intent was uh was battlefields and, and was was matters of, of states and, and nationhoods so when you look at a just one passage for example numerical weakness comes from having to prepare against possible attacks numerical mm. strength from compelling our adversary to make these preparations against us well, that's, a, that's a truism that's a fact that means the little guy can become more powerful and, and can have superior strategy can outplay outwit outmaneuver the bigger adversary by compelling that adversary to make preparations against him okay that's all factual that's all true how Right, so that's where I, I don't think the difference is in the um, is in the statements. I don't think the difference is in the the actual strategic point, which I think are pretty hard and fast, and we, we need to follow them as a as a guidebook. But I think in the the way in which we play those out and the way in which we execute execution is really you know my experience and Peter yours maybe yours and Mark's as well. Execution is where it really um, it happens or it falls apart. And so there's a lot of strategy that's well crafted, but it falls apart when organizations implement it and implement it poorly. Sure. And, and Mark, do you have any interpretation on on this as well? Yeah, I think it's interesting you, you, you kind of took the Western science approach and say you can't be something that's sort of you know, deductive reasoning. And, and I think one of the things we do in the West is try and take things apart. And the thing that strikes me about Sun Tzu's approach is it's very holistic. I think of the, I've got, the way I approach it is six principles that I've developed from Sun Tzu. Mm-hmm. And in my mind, the principles are like cords in a row. They become individually as strong, but when you twist them and put them together, holistically, they become unbreakable. And so the thing about it, Eastern philosophy <laughs> and Sun Tzu in general and Sun Tzu specifically, it's a holistic approach to how you uh, attend, to mil- attend to strategy, to competitive strategy. And it's not a recipe of, you know, do X, you know, or a formula for us to take the scientific approach. It's principles you employ in a holistic approach using the entire Sun Tzu approach of, you know, trying to win, win without fighting, and to attack weakness, attack weakness instead of strength. Um, all these things that you put together, these principles that you put together that he's been talking about to develop a holistic strategy and, and and um, so I think, to me, that's the difference between the, to a large extent, the Eastern and Western approach. In the Western world, we try to take things apart and do the pieces, and, and the Eastern approach is more holistic and, and um, you know, internally consistent. Yeah, because, Mark, when I was watching um, the, the history special on that, it was... Um it seemed as if there was the approach to it was like you know you find some historical context and then you attribute that to components within the strategy as opposed to and then we got to see some interesting case examples in Vietnam and in different world wars and and I guess the Cold War as well but but you know I always felt as if like when when I'm reading it it's how how different would it be from something in terms of like the text of like Nostradamus, right? He he wrote various different, I guess, uh, quantras, right? And and it's up to interpretation on how you want to interpret it. But as Becky's indicated, it's also about execution. So m- maybe perhaps um, before diving in too much about this, is can I get from uh, first you, Becky, and then you, Mark? What, what you guys think, especially in this modern era that we live in, as some of the key um, 
principles, you think, in terms of uh, strategy or, or tactics um, as far as either business or, or anything is concerned? Well, that's a, that is a huge question. Uh, and I think, it, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, Peter, I think that's a huge question. And I think <laughs> it really depends on the audience itself. I mean, I've written, as I said, my two books are focused on two very different audiences, one for small businesses and right. one for women in business. So yeah. if I'm talking to a small business audience, I'm really going to focus on superior strategy, how to outmaneuver a larger entity. I'm going to talk about the mandate for being united and not being divided. I'm going to talk about what, so what are your strategic strengths vis-a-vis a a larger organization? How can you amplify those strengths and and turn your weaknesses into strengths? So there's going to be a a little, a, a different focus, whereas if I'm talking to a group of women across organizations very often, or even within an organization, we're going to talk about issues that are really relevant and we see repeatedly among women in the workforce, issues of confidence, issues of authenticity, issues of uh, the phenomenon known as the imposter syndrome, how to have your voice heard. And all this, I, I draw from the text, I draw from Sun Tzu's Art of War to, to really um, really give, give courage and, and, and build on the inner person, build on the interior. So it, it really, so I mean, I, if I were to talk to a, to a small business audience, I would highlight 10 or 15 strategic elements and talk about those, maybe not 10 or 15, depending on the time I have, versus, uh, versus women, it's going to be a different, a different approach. So Mark may answer that a little differently. He, he might have uh, more of kind of a concise, you know, here's the things that I really would like to focus on, but, but mine really depend on the audience. Becky, can, can I just um, ask a quick question in regards to that statement? Is that aren't both either women or small businesses minority groups to begin with? So isn't there the aspects like you discussed about uh, confidence, building a voice? Isn't that also equally as applicable to a small business this day and age? Because it's effectively a minority versus, you know, large conglomerates or multinationals. And it's, it's using different platforms to try to, say, be heard and building brand and confidence. So I think there's some parallels in, in those two demographics that you kind of highlighted, by the way. Sure, sure. I, I would agree with that, uh, by all means, the, the, the minority approach and the, the really not what, – what I see with a lot of small organizations and, and even mid-sized organizations is, you know what, we want to be like the big players. So the way for us to be like the big players is to mimic the big players and do things like they do. Right. Well, that's fundamentally flawed logic because you don't have the resources, you don't have the reputation, you don't have the footprint, you don't have a lot of the attributes that a large organization is going to have. So, And it comes back to what Mark says about the Eastern-Western idea. The Western idea very often is force on force, um, strength on strength. Mm-hmm. Well, what happens when a big guy hits a little guy? You know, I mean, the big guy wins. I mean, that, I've learned that in martial arts over the years. <laughs> That's why <laughs> I've gravitated away from martial arts that were force on force because I'm smaller than the person who's trying to hurt me. Um, so the idea of working, as I said earlier, kind of playing on your strengths, understanding, and it's that understanding your strengths, understanding your weaknesses, understanding the competitive landscape, which is fundamental Sun Tzu. And it's the same thing for women in the workforce um, or women women in their careers. You've got to understand yourself. You've got to understand where you are vulnerable, what your weaknesses are, what are the the things that we're doing in our careers, the mistakes that we're making over and over again, what I call, I, I call those um, our pitfalls mm-hmm. versus our uniquely feminine competitive advantages, things that we are, and I speak in gross generalizations, not all women are good at, at all things that I, that I tend to highlight, but for example, collaboration, communication, emotional intelligence, those sorts of things where women tend to, to do better at them. And, and again, gross generalizations, uh, we break these down in workshops so it becomes very one-to-one. So you can see how the, the conversation is a little bit more intrinsic to the individual for the women I talk with versus intrinsic for a small business for the small businesses I talk to. But I do agree with you that a minority idea of, of utilizing your strengths and knowing those strengths and weaknesses is totally apropos to both audiences. Mm-hmm. Okay, and Mark, uh, do you have any um, key takeaways in terms of the, this, uh, the, the art of war? Yeah, I, when, I, when I developed my first book, Sons of the Art of Business, um, the, the subtitle is Six Principles for Managers. And the way I developed these principles was going through the art of war and cutting out the quotes that I thought, I mean, literally cutting them out, uh, that I thought applied to business. And then I kind of laid them all out on the floor and said, where do these things all fit together? And out of those 
groupings, I came up with six essential groupings, which became the six principles. And the, so the six principles that I think about it, got these for business and, and for warfare, but I'll talk about the business ones because I think that's what most of your audience is interested in. It's, you know, the first one's win all without fighting, capturing your market without destroying it. It really talks about um, how do we avoid price battles and going head to head um, and in the process, destroying the markets that we're in, destroying the profitability in the markets that we're trying to be successful in. Uh, the second principle is avoiding strength and attacking weakness, really finding out where the competition is vulnerable and using uh, those weaknesses because this goes a little bit back to what you and Becky were talking about is Sun Tzu is all about the wise use of resources and striking the, the weaknesses allows you to be much more successful than, than, than attacking strength. And so Sun Tzu is always uh, appealed, I think, to those uh, that may not be as strong as the competition. So it's a, it's a good way to use, it's a good approach to use if you're not as resource rich as the, the, the group or the, the organization you're competing with. The third strategy is foreknowledge, how do you maximize the power of business intelligence, really getting to understand the competition, the customer, and yourself, and using that information to do things like attack weakness. Um, the fourth principle, speed and preparation, trying to move swiftly to overcome the competition. So speed gives you many, many uh, advantages, throwing the competition off balance, being able to quickly uh, move after you've seen some success, um, being able to use speed in lieu of resources. Um, the fifth strategy is shaping the opponent, using strategy to master the competition. And this is where things like alliances and competition and things uh, making sure you hold strategic choke points, um, which in business could be patents, it could be um, seats on specific uh, uh, standards boards. And then lastly, kind of pulling it all together is character-based leadership leading by example and ensuring that um, your your organization is unified and that you've got, uh, that you lead not just by word, but actually by your behavior, which is much more impactful than and just talking about what you need to do, but actually showing people the way, uh, the way forward. So, so that's my set. Uh, I guess my six principles of how I come up, come in and approach uh, the art of war. So, so Mark and Becky, what what I'm getting from you is that, um, and I'm going to express this in layman terms, but. Would it be fair to say that um, as an individual or even as an organization, one should really be focused towards playing their own game? And and what I mean by that is is basically, well, how about let's take like the conventional route of one's life, for example, right? Typically, one um, it spends a lot of time in schooling, then one ideally gets a job, then gets the white picket fence, starts a family. What if, for example, if one is not um, akin to, to academics, for example, I, I noticed for me that I've had always, I recognize a long time ago that there's going to be people vastly superior than me, not only in North America, but especially in Asia, that they're going to be that much more superior in, in academics. And I always felt as if fighting um, the competition for the highest grades possible would be a very futile game to play, especially based on how the, the global economy is, especially when outsourcing and when cheap labor is available. Why must one strive to obtain the highest level of academics unless there, that brings some kind of like personal satisfaction. But if the ultimate objective is, say, for example, business success, then does not one, say if one was really good at playing the violin, for example, and they just continue to focus on that, is there some merit to um, exemplifying, even in one's own life or as an organization, your strengths, as you guys kind of indicated, but then also recognizing that, hey, there are some games. And I think of things from a very much a game theory perspective, because it seems as if it's the application of strategic thinking. Um, it would seem futile to do some aspects that everyone's playing and have become completely commoditized and to focus on some other things as well. I don't know what your thoughts are on that on Becky first, and uh, I'd like to get your opinion on that uh, as well, Mark. I even love the way you phrase that in terms of playing the game. Um, I'll give you a perspective on this. So when I speak with women in business, one of my 
um, one of the things that I counsel them to do, or one of the one of my talking points is, you've got to play the game. And here's what I mean by that: women, we, and again, and Peter, I'm going to speak in gross generalizations, and I don't mean to offend because I'm not suggesting all women do this and no women do this, and that's patronizing. But I, but I need to speak in gross generalizations to kind of to get my points across. Right. What we often find among women and I am one, so I can speak from personal experience, is, for example, in networking. We go, we, we, women are less inclined to want to do the play the golf games, do the golf outings, um, even do the after work in company network or out of company networking because right. we want to be home with our families. I'm sorry if that's offensive to folks, but we want to be home with our friends. We want to be doing other things, and we see it as disingenuous. We mm. see it as, wait, wait a minute, I want to do my job. I want to sit at my desk or, or wherever I do my job, my, I work, and I want to perform, and I want to be excellent. And I want my work to speak for itself and tell, and tell the entire narrative about my value as, as an employee or a CEO or whatever. But that's false. Men understand that it's about playing the game. Men understand that it's never, ever just about how hard we work or the quality of our work. It's about our relationships. It's about the golf outing we went on. It's about the in-company networking with the boss. It's about talking with the, the VP of sales or the CEO at that peer organization who may be your next boss or your next strategic alliance. So playing the game in, in, a, corporate work, in a corporate environment and even a small business environment is critical for us to, to really succeed and for us to win within the parameters of where we work and what we do. That's one point. But the other point I would say is, is I totally agree with you, oftentimes we've got to change the rules of the game. We've got to get on a different playing field to continue to use the, the game and, and playing field meta metaphors. You know, there are times where particularly, and I'm talking for, to women here, and men, you know, men just as just as relevant, we're in the wrong place, we're in, on the wrong battlefield. If, for example, I'm a very gifted collaborator, as many women, not all, and some men are, Let's say I'm a really good collaborator. I'm great at pulling people together. I'm a team builder. Um, I love to bring the most out of people, bring the best out of people. But I'm working in an environment where I'm told to sit in a corner or be siloed or be isolated, and that spirit of collaboration is not part of that work environment. Guess mm -hmm. what? It's not about changing the game. It's about getting out of there. It's about going someplace where my, my strengths, my, what I'm calling, again, uniquely feminine competitive advantages, can have an opportunity to, to shine. So I could talk about this topic all day and use some martial arts metaphors and examples, but I won't, I won't um, you know, beat you and the audience up with this anymore. But I love the idea, and I, and I think that that's 100% right. Sure. Mark, do you have any interpretation on this? I think the essence of Sun Tzu is just taking a different approach, right? The Western approach is, is to be very direct, um, and Sun Tzu's approach is more about being indirect, but it's really about being different. And I think, if you think about business in general, the essence of, of, of being successful in business is being different. What's different about you? Why should I buy from you? Um, and so, and especially when I speak from a branding and marketing standpoint, what's different about your brand? Why are you? Why should I buy what's, and, you, and you've got to find what's my unique differentiation as a company um, and as a brand. So when I think about being different, I think it's critical. And, and critical to being different is, is to be creative. What's, what's, you know, you can't be different unless you've got some creative way of having a, you, your offering is, you can make your offering different, you have your experience be different, you've got different processes. There's got to be something that you're doing differently that gives you competitive advantage. And so I think Sun Tzu tells you to be different. It gives you the courage to be different. Um, and so in my mind, the, the idea of being different has always made a lot of sense to me. And personally, I guess, you know, I started when other people were, you know, might be, you know, doing their, doing their job and, and uh, you know, working, et cetera. I went and, and you know, Becky did the same thing, we wrote some books and got them published, and that's different than what your typical person does, right? Yeah. Um, as soon as I got 30 years in the corporate world, I was executive, I, I continued, but I had enjoyed teaching, and so I you know, took my pension and I went off to teach, and that's what I'm doing now, and it's, you know, it's different, so, um, and, and <laughs> very enjoyable. Um, so I think getting back to, you know, what does this mean for business and what does this mean for life? I think from a, the standpoint of Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu is all about being different. And I think it's crucial uh, in business. I think it's crucial in life. And it, it, 
takes a creative approach. And that's, again, where Sun Tzu comes in. His approach isn't a recipe for how to do things. It's some principles on, on how to be creative. In, in terms of um, some of the stuff that we've talked about, I, it, it would be kind of interesting to kind of dive into some case examples with companies. Uh, perhaps, Becky, you could take one instance. I know in your book, which I have right here as well, you've covered uh, PayPal, Paychex, um, a whole bunch of other companies. Um, maybe you could give like one or two examples that exemplify a lot of the stuff we've discussed about and well, we'll do the same with you as well, Mark. Sure, and you're right that it's the art of war for small business is replete with examples of how small businesses have um, outmaneuvered and become, and I think in almost all instances, the if not the dominant player, at least a very dominant player. And it's it's I ha- what it's not so much about hey they read the art of war and they applied it in at least one instance that's the case but they may have unwittingly applied tenets of the art of war and applied the principles they may or may not have been uh, schooled in the art of war but if, if folks read this book and read the art of war then they will have um, they'll have a, a leg up and they'll have really more of a uh, a fast way to do that so Samuel Adams is is just one example of the of how to apply Sun Tzu's art of war Sam Adams you know the beer company um, Cook is the is the CEO of, of that company of Samuel Adams, and um, there, there really was no micro-brew market when he started out. Samuel Adams, the Sam, that beer company, really created, carved out the niche of the micro-brew, and they didn't do it by saying, you know, we're going to take on, at the time, Bud and Coors, the, the big, big beer, big American beer companies, we're going to take them on. Um, instead, what they did was they, they looked at the import market, and the import market was really Americans, was, when they wanted a, a good beer, they felt like they had to buy an imported beer. There was no premium American beer. Mm-hmm. So Samuel Adams set out to create a premium American beer that tasted better than your typical, um, your typical you know, standard fare American beers. And you, what you've seen is, has been a, a tremendous shift in the American beer market. I mean, you go into any grocery store, well, if you have beer sales in your grocery stores, depending on what state you live in, but you go in any place where beer is sold, and you're going to be in an entirely different environment than you were in 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, because they have the explosion in that micro beer market. And they own, um, they own only 6% of the entire beer market, but it's it is a multi million dollar industry. Um, so putting putting a lot of those tenants to work, they didn't set out like I said, they didn't set out force on force, one on one. We're going after cords, we're going after bub, we're going to unseat them. They said no, we're going to offer an alternative to the big beer brands. And um, the way in which Cook went about doing this was to really evangelize bar to bar. He was flying back and forth uh, to, from Boston to D.C. and going in, going in really guerrilla warfare and introducing beer uh, bars and, and places where you sell beer to his product and really giving them an opportunity to understand the competitive differentiators, the superiority of his product. So there's a lot of ways in which Samuel Adams and I. Um, um, others as well. Um, Ch- Chibani, a very similar story with the Chibani yogurt market. They very much carved out the Greek yogurt market. You know, you go in the grocery store now and you see all these brands of Greek yogurt, including the, the big brands, the, the big organizations, the big companies now are in the, the Greek mo- yogurt market, but that was not the case. There was no Greek yogurt. And the way in which they did it was identifying a niche and saying, okay, we know that the competitors believe that the unhealthy sugar laden products this is the the founders words not mine Mm. are are what american tastes desire but you know what we don't believe that we believe that americans are going to want a healthy alternative and they did some focus grouping they went to where people were uh they got a sense of what american buyers really did want and they the way in which they packaged it where they put it on the shelves all these things it, that enabled the, the product to stand out and, again, not to go one-on-one against the big guys, but to, but to find that niche. And now what's happened is the big guys are following them into the Greek yogurt market, which is really quite fascinating. Those are just a couple of examples. Really interesting. Yeah, let's continue that conversation. Um, Mark, why don't you uh, share with us some companies you've observed? Sure. When I think about, and this kind of goes back to what we were talking about, about being different and changing the rules, as Becky mentioned, um, there was a, a Zen master called Shinru Suzuki, and he said, in the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities, but in the expert's mind, there are few. And what he's saying is that experts, since they know a topic, 
really well tend to close their mind off to possibilities. And so if you want to be creative, if you want to be different, you've got to go back and get that beginner's mind. And there's a couple examples. Um, one is uh, the movie, this is a little bit old, older, it's, it's the movie Gorillas in the Mist. Um, and the director of the movie, Peter Gruber, couldn't really figure out how to get the gorillas to do what he wanted them to do. They weren't, they weren't following the script, essentially. Um, so they held a meeting, <coughs> and um, in a meeting, this intern said, well, why don't you let the gorillas write the story? Everyone kind of laughed at her, but later on, Gruber went to ask her, well, what do you mean by that? She said, well, <coughs> what if you send a really good cinematographer into the jungle, give them a ton of film, and shoot the gorillas, and then write a story about what they do? And that's actually what they did. That's how they filmed Gorillas in the Mist. And, and Gruber said this woman's inexperience enabled her to see opportunities where we still only boundaries. And so, again, you've got to take this beginner's mind approach <laughs> to, to strategy and in order to change the, the rules. And a company example of that is Cirque du Soleil. If you think about um, you know, entering the circus business at the time that Cirque du Soleil did that, uh, there were lots of other other. Uh, entertainment alternatives, so this was great problems for the circus business. You know, the, the whole circus approach was kind of a tired format. Got to be very expensive to run a circus with all the acts. You had these animals that were in there that people were worried about. They were getting hurt. You had this infrastructure. You had to move it around. And so all these circuses were fighting over dwindling market share. Uh, and of course, with Circus Alais, it, it didn't come in and do an, another circus. It looked at what customers wanted and didn't want it. They, they reinvented the circus, and so <clears throat> they, they essentially merged uh, the circus and theater. They, they got rid of the circus animals, which people were worried about anyway, uh, so they eliminated that. They moved from three rings to one, so they got our base attention focused on the, the, the one ring. They uh, made the tents more beautiful, comfortable. The clowns were more sophisticated. They added this theme and storyline for theater, um, and they... Uh, uh, artistry of acrobats and they changed the whole formula for what people really think of as a as a circus and and of course it, you know, anyone who's ever gone to a circus so late knows how much they charge and how successful they are and of course they you know as we've seen they've been very successful as they they changed the rules and they really took a new look at what entertainment could be uh, from that circus heritage so in in terms of um well i want to talk about one of the greatest uh, business strategists of of in recent history which is uh, warren buffett he actually coins a term called um an economic moat which means basically a competitive advantage but that is clearly indicated within the financials because investors and at the end of the day this is an investing or trading podcast but basically when, when looking at companies and analyzing them we try to identify um, these economic moats so in the case of coca-cola they clearly have a strong brand, but as far as accounting is concerned, you are not able to value the brand as anything. And the only way you can actually um, attribute this moat is through the ability for the company to sustain its, its uh, profitability margins. So and and that's seen consistent throughout history, like throughout its uh, the company's history, where they just continue to get more. Um, you know, they just produce more bottles of of Coke, and they're able to sell it and maintain um, their margins and benefit from an economy of scale to some extent. So I, I guess from a, a business perspective, small business, big business, how and when can one identify um, your competitive advantage that we talk about because there's many instances where i have seen disruptive technology completely change the rules of the game and at what point of time do you know that you are relatively secure with your competitive advantage and at what stage are you thinking about evolving or adapting and we've seen so many instances guys about this where like companies like kodak were still very much um, focused on their film business and then just were unable to evolve into the digital uh, film space and eventually has recently declared um, a bankruptcy as if they weren't already um, suffering a long time ago, but it just recently happened, right? When I look at even the video rental business, obviously you guys know about Netflix, um, even the PC industry, IBM, which is a company that Warren Buffett has invested in, is 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 changing its business model a lot. 
But I sometimes wonder what that competitive advantage is besides being extremely big and borrowing money、um, at very low interest rates based on the current economic environment we live in. So, Becky, maybe if you have any two cents on that, that would be great. Yeah, I think I, think I will. I'll say a few comments. I'd like to toss this to Mark and get, and get his perspective, particularly with some of the brands that you mentioned.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that Mark has, has written about those and has, has spoken about those, but、uh, I'll let him speak to that. But in terms of your question about when are you securing your competitive advantage and then when do you evolve and when do you adapt, well, Sun Tzu would say that you were constantly adapting,、yeah. you were constantly changing. Um, you, won't, you don't use the same, the same tactics you don't, you, more than once. You, you, you、um, modify, you rotate, you're constantly in a state of, of adaptation, of change to the enemy. So he's never able to track your movements, he's, he's never able to know where you're going to go next. So I, I think that that constant state of adaptation is one that, that businesses need to take to heart. It's easier for small businesses. Small businesses, by nature, Or sh- should be, especially the more innovative ones, like, like the ones you talked about, the ones that utilize disruptive technology, constantly、um, adapting and, and constantly doing things differently. And that is their, that's really a core differentiator. That's going to be a core value that, that small businesses are going to have over larger organizations. I mean, larger entities, they've got stockholders that they're beholden to, they've got to show profit, they've got a quarterly. That、every quarter, they've got to show movement somewhere, or that innovative entity, that, that, that thing that might actually be something, gets cut or gets reduced or gets changed. Whereas a small organization has more of a threshold to, to do things differently, to, to adapt and not do the same things the same way over and over again, just because that's really the lifeline of, of the business. So I would, I would just say that, and I really want to hear what Mark has to say.、Yeah. Um, when I think about, you know, you talk about Warren Buffett and Moats,、um, I think that falls into the, the principle for me, at least for Sun Tzu, shaping the opponent. How do you employ strategy to match the competition? How do you use things like brands and patents,、um, alliances,、uh, to really make sure you've got some, some strong、uh, defenses? And, and that's really, you know, Sun Tzu talks about having a strong defense. And using that、uh, as well to be successful. And, and, and、uh, as Becky mentioned, you know, constant creativity is important. I think to, one way to look and see if you're vulnerable as an industry、um, you know, are there major technological changes that are coming across? Of course, we saw the internet and what you know, Uber has done to taxis.、Uh, we see companies like、uh, Google and Apple looking at, to get into the driverless car space.、Um, are there changes in buyer makeup? Um, are there younger buyers coming in? Are there new emerging markets coming in? Are there channel changes? Again, the internet is, is one channel、uh, that's obviously been changing, shifting input costs, or you know, what's called a gentleman's game, where everyone is pretty happy with how things are in the industry.、Um, and they've divided up the pie and, and、um, you know, are, are okay with the way that you know, everyone's profitable.、Um, and then some other signals from a competitive standpoint are. You, know, you have unhappy buyers,、um, and I think that's where Uber's been pretty successful as well, as people aren't too happy with、uh, some of the taxi, uh, uh, the taxi industry and that experience.、Um, if you've been a pioneer of industry technology, that's probably another one、um, where you, know, you might be very wedded. As you mentioned, Kodak, you know, they were a pioneer in, in photography, and so they had all the things that they, they wanted、uh, you know, that, they, that made them successful. Profitable industries are also、uh, you know, vulnerable.、Um, so, those are some ways to, to look at yourself and say, hey, am, I, am I vulnerable? And then, as, as Becky said, and this again, where, where does creativity come in? You know, how do I take where I'm at and then look at what's changing and what do I need to do strategically to, to be successful?、Um, and, and, and again, that's where. Change and、uh, become a new startup, be successful, or an established player, ensure that you're not going to be、uh, to stumble and have your, your market taken by someone else. So, so, when you guys are obviously very uh, uh, cognizant of all the changes that are happening in the business world, are there any interesting spaces or, or tools? Because we're always talking about 
uh, potentially being different, utilizing your strengths, or exploring and building new strengths and skills that would be applicable in this new um, environment that we live in. Are there any particular industry sectors, um, skills that you think are extremely critical for survival as a business or even as a as a person in this new economy that we live in? Becky. Hmm. Specific tools that that are representative of, of of modern change that are what sort of representation, I guess, Peter, do you I think, think, think would be? Yeah, I think what I mean by that is uh, basically if we had this conversation in the 1990s, then I'd like to hear your answer being, you know, you need to become extremely well versed on the Internet. And, you know, these are some things that you might want to. Uh, be looking mm-hmm. into. I, I think that if, if there's anything that you guys observed um, recently, that would be really powerful. You know, um, I, I personally believe that one now needs to be that much more um, aware about the power of statistics and data analytics and how it can uh, be used. It, it's a phenomenon called like big data, right? To be used to uh, understand your competitor, right? It's it's actually analytical where you can actually understand your competitor and even understand yourself. And for the people that are going to harness that information, they clearly have some kind of competitive advantage. Or I always uh, tell my fiance that um, the computer is the new um, kind of like bow and arrow of, of this day and age. And if, if you don't know how to use one to its fullest and utilize all the tools, then um, you will suffer based on this whole new economy. And those are like maybe two examples that, that I can uh, give you anecdotally. Yeah, I would think, and Becky, you're welcome to chime in it, 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 as well, but I think a couple things to think about. Um, one is the smartphone. Yeah. Um, I literally just picked one up as you were saying that because I knew you were going to say it. But anyways, go on. There's so many different apps, um, and it's really become part of the in-store and after-purchase experience. So if you're a retailer and you're not you, you know, using the, the, the smartphone to help buyers um, learn about your products, to understand what your products are about, um, to help them after they purchased your product, to review your product, um, we know the, the, the role of the smartphone in the success of uh, companies like Uber. Um, and then that, that relates, I think, to the sharing economy. That's another thing I think you've got to think about is how could your, especially if you're an established player, how could um, the sharing economy change what is, is happening in, in my industry um, is another uh, related one. Um, I think the idea of the Internet of Things, if, you, if you're making any kind of products or, or services, how does, when you think of the Internet of Things, you know, where all products and services are linked to the Internet. Right. Um, they're selling toothbrushes that are linked to the Internet. Um, you know, your refrigerator telling you, you know, the groceries. Uh, so eventually, I think, you know, pretty much everything uh, will be linked to the Internet, so, you know, help you find stuff in your house. Um, so if you've got, you know, if you're making products, if you're, if you have services, how do I take advantage of this Internet of Things to make my product more useful to the consumer and more, and also provide me information about how the consumer is using it? Um, you're missing a big opportunity. And then to your point about analytics, I think big data, if you can harness it um, and then use it, one of the things that Sun Tzu's big on is speed, right? And how do I use speed to overcome the competition? Yep. Um, but all this data is out there, but how can I turn that data into something that's actionable right now that I can take advantage of? Having all that data is great, but unless I can turn it into something that allows maybe a salesman to, to do a better job uh, making a deal or to change what I'm ordering logistically so I can take advantage of uh, fashions. If I'm in the fashion industry, I think the analytics is key. And, and the last thing I would say is uh, relative to analytics and how it's changed sports. I mean, everyone who's read about Moneyball, again, yep. it's back to how, how do you be different, right? How do you use analytics in a way that no one else is using it? Um, so, you know, so like Billy Bean could you know, have the Oakland A's be much more successful 
given the fact that they don't have anywhere near the money of the Yankees. And yes. with career analytics, right? Um, there's another guy uh, in the football realm, and this gets back to the point that everything that Sanjay just applies to any kind of competitive strategy. Uh, there's a guy, Kevin Kelly, who, runs, who uh, uh, is the football coach for Plasky Academy. And he's the guy, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he's the guy that never punts. Um, so he's kind of, he does two things, a couple of things different. He never punts the ball, and at fourth down, he'll always go for it. And it's not because he's you know just this crazy coach. He's, he's He looked at a paper done by an economist on the success rates of punting and what happens when you punt the ball away. Even when he's deep in his own, uh, close to his own end zone, he'll punt. And I'm sorry, he will punt because it, it, when he looks at the probability of, of going for it and not going and not getting it, yeah, you know, the probability of the opponent scoring something like ninety percent. But if he punts it away, the other the opponent's going to get it on around their their fifty, and their chance of scoring is like seventy five percent. So he says, well, it doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really make sense to to punt it away. So he does that. He also, through analytics, will always do an onside kick um, whenever he scored, and he's looked at the numbers on that. And then he also runs, it's always like he's in a two-minute drill. He's never, he's going down, um, you know, doing the usual huddle up and play. He's always playing like it's the end of the game. Right. Um, and his winning record is just fantastic. And so, again, two, two things to point out. One is the analytics, the importance of analytics. Um in every endeavor and then using those analytics to be different yeah i'm actually mark i'm from um toronto and um one of the things that i experience um uh, being a fan of say for example professional sports don't worry becky we're gonna get back to to some interpersonal (laughs) relationship stuff but i I like to share you guys a kind of a story is that as you know, um, the position of Toronto is in the East Coast, um, which means that it is basically, typically in most major sports, Toronto has to share the same division with the likes of the New York entities, um, the Boston entities, and these are all very big markets. So a great example is obviously the New York Yankees are, uh, you know, the, the winningest team, I guess, in, in baseball and probably all of sports. And then you also have the Boston Red Sox, which are very dominant. Um, and, and had their run. And what's so interesting is the this is a business thing because uh, the Toronto Blue Jays are owned by a, a major uh, telecommunications conglomerate in Toronto called Rogers Communications. And basically, uh, one of their assets is, is a sports franchise, uh, very similar to, I think, how uh, Ted Turner was with... Um, uh, the the Atlanta Braves. So long story short is that the the key question is how do you stay competitive against the likes of the New York Yankees, which is always a great business question aside from just a sports question. And how do you stay competitive with the Boston Red Sox? And how do you even make the playoffs when the New York Yankees and the Boston Red Sox, and then occasionally some of the other American franchises on the East Coast? are always going to be extremely dominant. They're going to have a much larger budget uh, for some of these sports. They don't have um, a spending cap. So as long as the team wants, it can continue to outspend everyone else. And then how do you know when to step on the pedal to try to be competitive? And and that was one of the great um, issues that that the the Toronto Blue Jays experienced. They have not uh, been in the playoffs over the last 20 years since winning the World Series in 1992 and 93. But since, um, as of this year, for the first time, they actually made the playoffs. But from a revenue standpoint, as soon as they started to win, the stadium went from attendance of, say, 14,000 all the way up to like 49,000 people full house uh, sold out in the Sky Dome, in, which is in a sport town that probably is more um, focused on hockey as opposed to uh, baseball because America baseball is more of an American pastime. So it, it's, it's very interesting because the general manager of the team needs to request from the corporation and the board to have more of a budget to go out there and acquire some of these good players. But you've got to do that 
in a time when you think you could win. So, so the long story short is that during the midseason, their their record was about five hundred. Basically, they they won just as much as they lost, and you know they weren't really in in playoff contention. But going into the second half of the year, then they started to make some big moves. Um, as a result, they ended up winning a little bit more. As a result, the attendance in the stadium started to to start to pick up, and the ratings started to pick up, which was a, then um, a, a major benefit for the the corporation that allowed them to accelerate some of their spending. So it's it's such a interesting uh, business problem as well as a sports story as well and and if you if you get a chance you should definitely look into that because it, you're once again analogous to to like a big competitor that's the new york yankees right that is an interesting uh problem because you're right the the revenue is contingent upon how successful the team is how well it can win games which is uh, a little bit different than the the business problem in and of itself the two i mean obviously the two are very very much attached. I mean, I think that when it comes to competing against a monolith like the New York Yankees or like uh, the big name Greek, the big name yogurt manufacturers or the big beers, it's about going when this is quintessential Sun Tzu, go where the enemy isn't. Going not going not up against whatever the strengths are of uh, the Yankees franchise, but where are they vulnerable? Where aren't they? What aren't they? How how are we able to um, differentiate again to use the word again differentiate so going where the enemy isn't I think is uh, I think is fundamental and you know you're, you're talking about tools and, and and things that we can that we can use that are kind of next generation and modern and those are relevant conversations and important conversations but I think even more important than the tool um, and the thing that's that's powerful right now is the enduring strategy of Sun Tzu's art of war and some of the things that we really haven't talked about are customer loyalty, right. employee loyalty, how well you care for, and for Sun Tzu, it's how well you care for your troops. There's no customers for Sun Tzu, there's, but there are alliances, of course, and there are, um, there are soldiers, there are people who, who you need. So what we, often, what we see too often is that desire to uh, focus on the next customer, that desire to focus on the next win, that desire to focus on the next big deal, the next big contract, and losing track of um, of the customer base that you have, so that that focus on on loyalty. One of the best examples of that is Zappos. You know, Zappos was acquired by Amazon, um, very very successful company, and their whole model was on building fanatical customer loyalty as well as employee loyalty. They gave new recruits famously two thousand dollars not to work there. If you rather have two thousand dollars today than to build a career with us, doing something that you care about and doing something that matters, then we really don't want you here. We'd rather you work someplace else. So that that idea, uh, the, the strategic principles of having having uh, customers and having employees who are so enthusiastic about what you do and who are so loyal, that is a that's such a competitive differentiator that I think a lot of organizations lose track of in the in the idea in the transactional. Um, new customers, new deals, new whatever mindset. We, we lose track of some of those principles. Becky, I, I wanted to ask you is that in, once again, in this global economy, how do we maintain or how does one express uh, their personality, especially if some of these examples you gave are, are like digital entities? So like imagine if you are... Mm -hmm. Uh, the founder of a new uh, dot com. How is it that you can take all those things that are special and different about you as an individual, those interpersonal components, and then share that uh, to the the thousands and and millions of of viewers on your site or on your YouTube channel or on your podcast or something like that? So, so is your question, how do you articulate those differentiators to a broad audience? Correct, correct. Yes, yes. How, how yeah. can you convey that? But remember, th something that can possibly get lost in that is the component of passion, which is also very important because that's a big factor. If, if when I'm listening to you guys and you guys are like art of war 24-7, that, that – I, because I can hear that in your voices, I, I know that to be the case. But assuming if I just... 
Well, I mean, that even hearing you describe this is even a better job than than what I see in your book because your book could be you you don't know the context or the tone of that as opposed to sure. when I hear you in person, for example. Sure. Sure. So my answer to that would be that consistency again, that unity, that unity of spirit that Sun Tzu talks about. Carrying that out through every single customer experience. I mean, you're talking about the dot com. You're talking about probably uh, web based online engagements. So you're, but but everything from a chat conversation to a call into customer service, um, and even across the brand, across the brand, the the all you can't say. And I'm, I'm you know the example that comes to mind. I'll let Mark talk about that in terms of consistency of brand. Um, is and Mark maybe you'll address that is where a fast food chain got into the luxury hotel industry and. It's a complete disconnect of what the brand of that um, fast food chain was and what the ho- what they were trying to be. So that you, you can't say we're rabid about our, fan- our our fans or we're rabid about our customers and then not deliver on that. So I would just say it's a long game, right? It's so how do you do that? I mean, it's a marketing challenge, but it's really a delivery challenge. Um, are we losing track of those principles that are we are going to care for our customers, we're going to care for our employees, and we're going to do it better than anybody else? If that's not actively part of something that you're doing on a day-to-day basis as an organization, then you're going to lose track of that. All it takes is one or two lazy people you know, and one or two lazy engagements with a customer, and you've lost that customer for life. So, I mean, it comes down to the, the marketing challenge, the branding challenge, and the delivery challenge. But overarching across all of those are the strategic underpinnings of okay, how are we different? Are we just are we are we selling wallpaper like everybody else? Then you don't need a differentiator. Just open up, you know, open up a store, or open up online and sell wallpaper, and you know, just you know, get by. But are you trying to dominate the wallpaper industry? Are you trying to really, um, really make a strategic move over organizations that are already perhaps entrenched? So it really comes down to how badly you want it, I think, versus. Um, the, the appetite you have for really, really being, um, you know, a dominant player versus really, really just kind of going through the motions. And as you know, in, in your day to day world, I'm sure you, you see both kinds. Well, I, I actually have an amazing um, dichotomy that that's actually he probably made me a little bit more astute uh, to some of these aspects. As I indicated to you guys, is I'm originally from Toronto, so I, I know what it's like to ha- be next door to a very big market such as the United States and having to deal with that um, that dichotomy. But also, um, I'm actually, and, and Mark, this covers a lot of the stuff that's in that History sh- uh, Channel um, documentary, or which was about... The, um, the I'm from Vietnam, and what I get to hear about is to interact with Vietnamese people post the war about business, and do not doubt for a second that that has not all these thousands of years of war has not actually translated to the day to day interaction in terms of business. And, and it conveys, because when you take a look at some of the, the reoccurring winners of the World Series of Poker, you're going to see that they're Vietnamese. And, and when you huh. th- take into account that I would argue, I don't know if you guys um, share my opinion on this, but actually Vietnam is the single um, greatest war country um, over the last several thousand years, right? No country has an- managed to fend off uh, Genghis Khan and the Mongolian Empire, like, um, well, at that time it was in Vietnam, but some part of this region at that time, um, they face the uh, the Chinese for thousands of years, even to this day. In terms of geopolitics, you're still hearing about land disputes there. They've um, encountered the French, um, the Japanese, um, the Americans, as you know. And Americans, sure. yes, so it. I've never seen such a uh, such a almost gruesome track record over thousands of years. And when, when you look at one of the neighbors, which is Thailand, which has never really had to fight a war, and is on, their economy is only about 10 times bigger than Vietnam, when you take into account all these wars that have happened over thousands and thousands of years, and for a market like Thailand to only be 10 times bigger than Vietnam, and Vietnam's on the rise now, then that I find that to be extremely interesting. And then when you have to interact on a day-to-day basis, good luck trying to get one up on them in terms of business. Mm-hmm. 
Well, I know that Vietnam is a is from a military standpoint. I'm not familiar with with the the business evolution in Vietnam right now. That's right. fascinating, but it's not surprising because uh, certainly from a military standpoint, we know that the um, the Vietnamese during at least during the time in which the the Americans were there, and I'm, I'm sure preceding that as well, uh, were, the 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 um, generals there were extremely well versed in Sun Tzu's art of war, and exactly um, that. That's what really brought it to brought that text to the attention of the American military, and really kind of introduced us in a larger sense in the in the West to Sun Tzu's art of war. So that is, and I've I've had a, a very uh, keen interest in that that era, that Cold War era, particularly in as it played out in Vietnam, right. the military strategies there as well, um, and how, as you said, um, a force a force can be so a people can be so attacked for so many so many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years and be so resilient and what what enabled them to be resilient and to drive folks out of their territory and i think that we find a lot of those strategies in the art of war played out to to their credit so even bad, on, regardless of your you know good guys bad guys politics regardless of that if you just look at it from the military and the strategy standpoint it's very fascinating yes and and what i'm trying to say is that even in my my daily interaction from business because i think that's something about asians is that they're exposed to a lot of these um how, how would i describe it basically they're, they're watching basically these historical um uh chinese movies that involve like kings and princes and queens and and it's not always like a happy ending in these stories because there's a lot of confucianism that's that's embedded into some of the plots of many of these like soaps and movies so sometimes the good guy doesn't win sometimes the king remains being the king and everyone needs to bow to that individual but i think it's because of this this history uh the components of culture that when i I'm participating in like some kind of game, be it like, you know, obviously not war games or anything like that, but any kind of like um, uh, a challenge where there's a, a, a component of competitiveness, I've, I've almost basically folded my hand as far as saying, okay, how can I compete on a domestic perspective? But perhaps what I can do, which is my competitive advantage, is to bring I don't know, have people like Mark and Becky talk about Vietnam, which I know someone in Vietnam couldn't do, and then provide a perspective and insight on what they think um, uh, from a perspective of strategy and, and use that as even potential sound bites when referring to, to uh, strategy and business um, in Vietnam, for example. There are certain bridges and, and things. Well, that's, that's one, for example, but we're talking about like our focus, which is about like asset management, right? We have, there's um, a focus towards investment and foreign direct investment into these kind of countries post the war um, and, and thinking about who can be a conduit for that and trying to identify what kind of entity. So hopefully in the future, if Mark and Becky think about, hmm, perhaps there's going to be some interesting opportunities investing in Southeast Asia, perhaps I need mm -hmm. to contact Peter in that instance. And I feel that those are some of the competitive advantages that I have um, as opposed to trying to say compete on a one-on-one -on -one business, like you, like you guys said, you don't go directly head to head with with something that you don't think you have a competitive advantage in. Well, one, of the, you know, one of the things, one of Sun Tzu's quotes that I think is really important is, you know, he says he says what to do, but also a big part of strategy is saying what not to do. And, and one of his quotes is, you know, there are some roads not to follow, some troops not to strike, some cities not to assault, and some ground which should not be contested. And I think. One of the key things you really got to think about is not only where do I want to go, but where do I, do I not want to go? And, and your whole conversation about Vietnam, um, you know, and, and their ability to repel invaders, um, kind of, this is sort of not Sun Tzu. But you, you go back to the battle of Woods and Princess Bride, it's like there are the two cardinal rules, don't go, don't go up against the Sicilian, but that's, that is on fine. <laughs> you know, right. Don't, don't go in a land war in Asia. <laughs> so... You know, relating that back to Sun Tzu is again there's some some for some roads not to follow. Okay, so um, we've already crossed the hour mark in this conversation. I, I want to end this off with basically uh, two questions. And one question, um, which would be typically in the first few chapters in any kind of like business course, which is about ethics. Um, I guess my question is that. It seems as if, and w when you look at like um, the the kudos that Vietnam gets for its guerrilla warfare tactics, thinking about that, it almost implies as if there are no rules to war. 
I guess when talking about business then, and that's an interesting question, is that how does one manage um, ethics and integrity while also being cognizant of defeating their competition and being dominant in the market? One of, uh, one of Sun Tzu's, well, his first of five constant factors for, for his ideal general is the moral law, that that general would follow the moral law. Um, and it would cause the people to be in complete accord with their ruler. So that, that really comes down to character and to the leader's character. So you, we also know that Sun Tzu says that deception is the art of war. Right. Deception is it's quintessential to warfare. So where does that leave us? Well, I think that leaves us in a gray area, quite frankly. Um, that's my interpretation. I am an honest person. I don't make a habit out of lying to people. I don't lie in my in my business dealings. I'm I'm up front with people. I'm up front with customers. I'm up front with partners. Um, I'm 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 even people who you know are. I mean, I'm not going to tell a competitor everything that they want to know, but but I'm honest. Um, I also, however, will allow. Um, a, an adversary's misinformation to allow them to utilize that misinformation. I'll give you an example of this. United Scrap Metal was uh, founded by Marcia Serlin. It's now a, it's, it's a huge, uh, very successful organization, scrap metal business. She started it out very, very small. It was her, a rented truck, and a few hundred dollars. And a lot of reasons why she started it, and I won't go into a lot of that, but it was family circumstances, and, and she had to make it and um, started, as I said, with nothing. Well, she's this woman in the Chicago area hauling junk metal, hauling scrap out of scrap yards. And, and the men just kind of laughed at her. They didn't take her seriously. They just either mocked her or they ignored her. And she would very, very slowly and very carefully and intentionally just block, buying up land behind this clandestine shack that looked like, she said, the, San, the Sanford and Son TV show. It looked like nothing. And she was building this empire, this scrap metal empire. Meanwhile, her competitors were, were just kind of laughing at her and mocking her, and she allowed that, that misinformation. She said, allow yourself to be underestimated when it's to your advantage. Right. So, that, so that's, that, that, to me, is a play on deceit. So you allow that deceit that somebody else holds to, to play against you. And obviously for, but for businesses, we, if you're a small business you don't wanna, and you want to compete against a big organization, your website doesn't have to say, hey, we're the little guy. We really can't deliver like the big guys can. We really don't do this. We can't do that. That's, I mean, that's honest, but that's foolish. So you really let those, the, the good things shine through. So you tell the story as you want to have it perceived and as you want to have it interpreted by the world. So there's a lot of ways to, to to angle that, I, I would say I would I would always counsel never to compromise your integrity or your principles because at the end of the day, what is your business if it's not founded on your core principles and your core integrity? Obviously, not everybody believes that. Not everybody plays by the same set of rules. But mm. um, and at the end of the day, everything ultimately comes to light. And and being um, hurtful and dishonest and any number of other things ultimately does harm to a business, does harm to investors, that does harm to to stockholders, and, and really doesn't doesn't help in the long term. Sure. Mark? Um, uh, you know, one way sometimes I summarize Sun Tzu is there's a military axiom that says if you find yourself in a fair fight, you didn't plan properly. Um, <laughs> and when I, when I think about, but, 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 but let's talk about what is fair fighting. And I think what, what is defined as a fair fight is that's how we're used to competing, right? We always, you know, blockbuster expected to go up against other blockbuster type places that you go into to rent your video and didn't expect a, um, a red box type approach um, or a Netflix type approach. And when we say, so when we talk about changing the rules, sometimes people interpret that as, well, you're breaking the legal rules. And we're really not talking about breaking the legal rules. We're talking about changing the rules and how companies compete, right? So when we talk about, you know, not finding ourselves in a fair fight, we're saying we're not going to compete the same way that everyone else has done. We're going to find a creative new approach to be different that's going to allow us to, to win the battle before it's fought. And so, you know, to, 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 so that's the one distinction, and I think where Becky and I are, you know, come from um, is you, know, we, you, know, you follow the legal rules, you follow the ethical rules, and within those boundaries, you find you, you, can, you use the principles to change the rules in how you compete. Right. So it's about how do I change the rules and change it for being a fair fight into one that's to my advantage, but it's about 
changing the, the way we usually compete. It's not about breaking legal or ethical rules. Okay. Well, um, thank you very much, guys. This has been a very interesting conversation. I, I, I want us to continue this, so I hope we can do some uh, like a part two because I still have a ton of other things that I want to ask. But perhaps we can leave it off with um, one more question. And um, The Art of War is actually uh, probably one of my favorite books um, of all time. I get. I guess the question is that for anyone else that's that's listening in, and for anyone that are, is very well versed at the art of war, is that who? What other strategists or books do you think is very complementary or adds on top, or or maybe is even superior to the art of war? I know there's like the Five Rings. I know. Um, uh, John Boyd has some very interesting modern interpretations using the OODA loop. Um, Machiavelli, I like what he has to say as well. To some extent, it's, it makes for an entertaining read. Um, and, and Robert Greene, I think, is putting some very interesting stuff together as well. Uh, maybe you guys want to add something to this as well. I would say, so the Book of Five Rings I really enjoy. I find that it is um, it's a little more difficult to make a a practical application of that, but as a, a practitioner of a, a sword, a Japanese sword-based martial art, I, I really, really enjoy the Book of Five Rings. But I would say more in a more modern context, the texts that I think are complementary, maybe not in the same category as The Art of War, but very much complementary. I love Malcolm Gladwell's Tipping Point. Uh. I think it talks about, you know, obviously tipping points and how to create phenomena and how to create um, how, how things happen, right? How right. things really become viral. And, and how they don't. I really enjoy that. And um, Callaway's becoming a category of one. I talked about building customer loyalty, building employee loyalty, and really becoming standout organization based on consistency to those principles. That's a book that I really come back to. I mean, it's it really the fundamentals. At the end of the day, the fundamentals are really fairly simple. But in applying those consistently, that's, that's, where, that's what's not so fundamental. So those are a couple that, that I find to be very complementary to, um, to Sun Tzu's Art of War. Also, Napoleon Hill, it's a classic, Think and Grow Rich, but that idea of the internal, uh, what you, the, the drive that you have internally, that's, we really didn't get into that, that in our conversation today, maybe in, in a follow-on conversation. Yeah. Um, but the idea of Sun Tzu's Art of War, the idea of winning a battle before you ever fight it. What do you have? What what ha- preparation have you done internally? Right. I mean, I'm almost using modern words in, in, in saying that, but and that kind of plays into the martial arts aspect as well. But when you, when for you to say, I am ready, I am prepared, I'm going to take this hill, or I'm going to take this negotiation, I'm going to get this. I've I've done what I needed to do. I'm fully prepared. I've already I've already won. Before I engage, before I open my mouth, before I walk into that conference room, I've already won. So I think that Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Riches is, is consistent with that in a little different context. That's excellent. Um, Mark, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I think B.H. Um, Little Hart was a military theorist um, yeah. in the world, two world wars and really, in many ways, helped create the blitzkrieg approach. Um, his book on strategy, the art of the indirect approach, mm. um, is really, really very much tied to um, Sun Tzu's approach. Um, and, and he actually relates back to Sun Tzu. So from an historical standpoint, I think it's a great book that uh, is sort of a corollary in my mind of, of Sun Tzu's Art of War um, and very much tied to you know, that kind of philosophy. So uh, these little arts uh, on strategy. Well, that's fantastic. Um, maybe I can share to you guys a, a few books that I like, and they might be relevant to what you guys are doing too. There is a book called um, Smart Cuts, which is written by a gentleman named uh, Shane Snow. And the book is basically about how people find um, smart cuts as opposed to shortcuts. Shortcuts sometimes mean mm-hmm. means like you're cheating, uh, but smart cuts are m- managing to parlay from one position to another uh, and it, one of the great examples he gives is the average age of every president of the United States. And he monitors the period of time in which those individuals have actually spent 
um, in politics, like rather as opposed to being a career politician, um, like a guy like Obama, just being able to come out from grassroots and then to effectively become the president at a relatively young age, um, as opposed to the conventional thinking of what it would take to rise to the highest rank of power. So Smart Cuts, I think, is a, a very fascinating one. Um, and there's many different examples in that book. I just wanted to use the presidency as, as an example. The other one I like a lot is one called Mastermind, How to Think Like Sherlock Holmes, um, which ah. basically discusses like um, Sherlock Holmes's methodology. Um, and, and the peer, you know, throughout all the Sherlock Holmes movies and shows, you see him sitting there and smoking a pipe for a long time. But at that time, that's when he's developing his strategy. And he, but he needs mm. to be away as opposed to just like doing, doing, doing. Uh, what makes him a great detective as opposed to other people would be the other people might just try to search for clues or hunt down who they think is a suspect or the killer. Whereas Holmes would take a much more uh, patient approach, a much more methodical approach, and a much more observative approach. So I like that one too. And then because we have a business audience and I had him on the podcast recently is a book called The Outsiders eight unconventional uh, CEOs and their radically rational uh, blueprint for success, which is looking at CEOs that aren't exactly uh, focused on building like fame for themselves as individuals, but focus on building good businesses and um, you know what it takes to build a good one and thinking about dividends to shareholders, shareholder buybacks, thinking about shareholder growth. Um, and it's actually recommended by Warren Buffett in one of his um, annual newsletters. So uh, yeah, basically that's that's the book club for today. So um, yeah, good stuff. Well, thank you guys. It was great talking to you. I hope to um, have you guys on uh, on the Big Trade Series. We've already changed the rules of the game by having two guests at one time. So <laughs> that's one rule we've broken. And um, if we don't stop this anytime soon, we'll end up breaking another rule, which is probably the longest single episode. <laughs> so um, oh. it was great talking to you and um, look forward to speaking to you guys soon again. Thank okay. you, Peter. We hope you enjoyed this mastermind session. If you'd like to contact Peter Pham or Phoenix Capital, please email info at phx-cap.com.